Hello, everybody. I uh, hope you're all comfortable. Thank you so much for coming out on a very cold, grey German evening uh, to sit in a room of warmth and light with us. Uh, this is a talk as part of CTM Festival with Red Bull Music Academy. Um, we've had a couple of talks as, as part of CTM uh, of people who come from very distinct musical worlds and in those worlds they are very innovative and, and have built a character all of their own uh, and with me on the couch is a DJ and producer who has been a leading light in his very unique musical world which is ballroom and we're going to get into the sound of that the culture of that Mike's role in that and just riff on the subjects that are really close at heart to the subject uh, so please help me welcome Mr Mike Q. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Okay, great. Now, let me set the scene. Uh, ballroom did not start in Berlin, where we are. It started somewhere very different. Uh, if you've never been to New Jersey, how would you describe it to someone? Jersey. Um, well, I'm from East Orange, New Jersey, which is up north, uh, about 30 minutes outside of New York City. Um, and... You know, it's your average suburban ghetto, you know, not always the safest place, but it's a place my family and I have been able to call home uh, for the past 30 years and I'm still there. Mm. Um, what's also great about um, East Orange in particular is uh, all, all the musical greats that come from there. So Whitney Houston, Queen Latifah, Naughty by Nature, um, a lot of people come from there. So, you know, it's great to be from there. Do you feel that there's a particular, like you just mentioned all those artists, do you feel that there's a particular attitude when it comes to music? Maybe not necessarily one particular sound, but an attitude that comes to music that's quite indicative of that part of New Jersey? Or um, No, not really. I mean, a lot, a lot of talent, um, but between the artists I just named and a lot of the DJs and producers I know, a lot of good music comes out of Jersey. So it's, it's a place full of talent. Um, in, in whatever way that is. Should we play a song just to get everyone in the zone of this music? Why don't we play uh, a song from like your youth in New Jersey? Okay. How does that sound? Okay. Sure. Why don't we? Um, why don't we s s kind of set the scene of what it was like to drive around New Jersey as a kid? Okay. Cool. How about? Uh, let me see. The, we also preface this. We have fifteen hours of music. Uh, for this, so we've got so much music we can pick from. Uh, what about? Mm. It's literally impossible not to sit and try and sing along to that. Yes. <laughs> um, that's amazing. Um, so, th would this be kind of the sound of driving around as a kid in Jersey? Is this the kind of beats that would be in the car? Uh, yeah, um, particularly my aunt, uh, Gloria, she, um, back in like the early nineties, she was the first person to kind of expose me to house and dance music. So, you know, she went out to clubs and stuff back then. And anytime she would come pick me up to go to her house, she always be playing like this track or, uh, Marshall, Marshall Jefferson, um, a lot of earth people. I mean, uh, Earth by dance people, excuse me, um, and just stuff like that. So, you know, I still didn't really know what it was, but it's something that I liked. Mm -hmm. And as a teenager, where did you kind of fit in this musical landscape? Like everybody as a teenager, like feels like they belong to like a little, like a musical tribe. So was there one for you? Like what grabbed you at the start? Um... At the start, well, from there, um, I really didn't get into music. It was a bit later in, let's say, 98 when I'm in, like, the sixth grade. So a lot of teens in Jersey went to the skating rink uh, back then or just had, like, a lot of high school or school parties, dance parties and stuff like that, or parties in the house. And um, they would be playing a lot of dance music, mostly stuff out of Baltimore um, at the time, not so much of the, the older classic house. Um, so that's kind of what you do in Jersey as a teen is, you know, listen to like the Baltimore stuff. So that's what we did. That's what you did. Um, obviously, if you're if you're not old enough to get into clubs, you have to like do your own parties. Did you ever were you ever part of a street team? 
Never. Um, I never even went to parties when I was younger. Like I said, I went to the skating ring maybe two or three times and then just house parties. But there was a, a school around the corner from EVLD and it was, a, it was a middle school. So I was able to get into those parties, but I just never went because I was never the type to, to party and stuff like that. Um, so it was a music store um, in my city, Johnny's Music World. And I remember after I got my first job in the sixth grade, I had got my first check or whatever. And I went and bought a CD player. I went and bought the Pokemon soundtrack. Ooh. And this CD, this club CD that they had at the store, which I had bought maybe four times in total, that had a lot of this older Baltimore tracks and stuff on it. So that's what I listened to in my personal time. Mm. Speaking of um, CDs that you've got, uh, what's that? So this is my huge collection of CDs that um, I've had. It's a funny story with this because before I started collecting these, I had an actual, show. Show. a smaller, a smaller book. It was only about 30 CDs and I got robbed for it coming out of a, a club one night um, and this is after I started DJing, and this happened after I said I wasn't going to do it anymore. So this is the CD book that I used to play out of from 2005 to 2010 before I switched to Serato. I should note that this is in a chronological order, right? Yes. Yeah, so is. you can literally see the music aging with every little cover. It's absolutely incredible. So, so you got robbed for your music? Yes. Um, after I started DJing uh, at the Globe in Newark, um, it was, you know, the gay party to go to. There. It was a New Year's party, New Year's of 2005. And coming out after that night, um, these four guys had pulled up in the car and that was a, a friend of mine. And they took my CDs, my coat, $400 earrings. And, you know, after that, I was just like, I'm not going to do this no more. Um, I hadn't even really started DJing. I would only do like maybe a 30 minute set at this party mm. back then. So, you know, I hadn't really started yet, but. Mm. Is that, um, I mean, we've heard stories of, uh, not to speak about one particular incident, but we've heard stories about, you know, DJs being robbed because, you know, one, because it's a crime, but also because the music was so competitive and hard to get it hands on. Uh, was that just like a random thing or was that was, part of? It was a random thing. Okay. Um, like I said, Newark in particular is not the safest place in Jersey. So, you know, stuff like that happens all the time. So you mentioned, obviously we have this huge pile of CDs and CDs are kind of like the foundation of you starting to DJ and produce. Um, could you tell me a little bit about you starting to DJ at the Globe and what kind of format that you'd be playing music on? Well, um, I didn't go to the Globe until, it was October in 2003. I was in high school, maybe 10th grade at the time, 11th. And I had always heard about this party. Um, friends in school would be talking about it, but was just always afraid to go because again, I had never been to a party before. And finally, one night we went out um, just me and him to this party and you know it was like the most amazing thing that I had ever been to um, the DJ at the time he would play a lot of hip hop reggae Jersey club because that's what you do in Jersey and then that's also the first time that I got introduced to ballroom which it was only like um, a three minute segment not even three minutes at the time where he would just play two or three tracks at the end of the night and that's where everybody would vogue for you know a hot second before the club was over with and that was my first introduction into ballroom and from there i started like looking for more of the music so i'm on america online at the time dial up and stuff um I had a friend on there who led me to a club in Harlem called The Clubhouse that had their parties on Thursday nights. The Globe was Friday. This was Thursday. And The Clubhouse was kind of the equivalent to what The Globe was, just in a New York form. Play the same music, except there they would play more reggae and no Jersey Club at all because that wasn't really a thing for them. And then they had an actual ball at the end of the night. Um, so I went out to this place and I had bought CDs from the DJs there and still hadn't really found a lot of ballroom music. Um, but I wanted to hear more of it. I loved it so much, the dancing, the music, it was something different about it. Um, 
And I can actually, if you want to play the first track that I've okay. ever heard. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. So what is, um, so this is the first one you'd ever heard at the Globe or the this party in at Harlem? The, at the Globe okay. um, in 2003. And it was a Von Allure track. And I didn't know who the artist was, the DJ, who was a straight DJ actually at the time. So he was a straight and DJ playing a gay, a gay yeah, ball. Yeah. Interesting. Which probably explains why he only played a small segment of... <laughs> So good. Yeah, so he would. Uh, he would so play. Sorry, what was that called, and who was it by? Was, and I say, I say by because there's edit, and then there's edit, and then there's edit. Right. So that yeah. was make these bitches gag by Von Allure, which was you know one of his highs once you know he started remixing Masters at Work highs for the ballroom scene. Um, so it was that uh, Dendada by George Krantz and Satisfaction by Benny Benassi that the DJ would play, and that's only thing that I heard ballroom mm -hmm. or ballroom like um, so then like I said went to this club the clubhouse in Harlem and got acquainted with the DJs there bought some music but still just didn't have enough of it I didn't know who Von Allure was at the time um, it was Angel X and Tony Cortez that was playing this party um, so um, a few months down the line a friend of mine Scooter Balenciaga, that's his house name. He brought uh, the program Fruity Loops mm -hmm. and Acer Pro to my house. Um, he wasn't a producer or anything like that. He just knew of these programs, which I had never heard about. He didn't even know how to use them. And he brought them to my house, and I just started like playing with them and like making my own edits and stuff. So that's how I kind of got like started. And it was a ballroom forum. At the time, walkformewednesdays.com, where everybody would go, uh, it was called the Shade Room. So you go up there, post about balls or talk about people and just a whole bunch of gossip. And they had like a music section. So that's where I would post my edits and stuff. And that's how I kind of got like heard about. So eventually I became the DJ at the Globe and the Clubhouse in 2005, just a year after I had started producing. Mm. There's a lot in there. Okay, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go go back a little bit to listening to to hearing that if you want to lure track for the first time. Um, partly why the ballroom sound is so fascinating and so innovative is because it kind of did away with like the verse verse break kind of structure of like older like house records that were used for like old way and new way, and it basically just found the breaks and made entire instruments out of them. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what you think like the genesis of the ballroom, that new ballroom sound is? Um, well, um, if you if you ever hear Von Allure talk, because he, you know, he's who I get my inspiration from and things like that. And what it was with with the ballroom sound and, and those older house tracks that they would play and to what it had became, he would go to balls and um bring out a whole bunch of records and he said that everybody only wanted to hear the hot all night um so you have this you know something like this huge you're carrying around but everybody only want to hear two or three songs for the night so that's where he started to remix that hot into different tracks and he would make tracks for for categories so you know every category has different a different track that you would play for that so he made category specific tracks and that's where that kind of got started so the ha is such an the ha dance is such an iconic track for this for masters at work. Um, particularly, why do you think do you do you know why Ivana Lure or this early ballroom sound picked up on that in particular? Because it's almost really unique to ballroom that at one track, like one break in a track, has manifested into thousands of edits. Um, and I'm not uh, I'm not sure on where it exactly came in. Um, Talking to one of the other legendary DJs in the scene, DJ Carlton, and he's uh, he's been DJing balls longer than Vaughn. He doesn't produce or anything, and he's another you know straight guy. He's from East Orange, where I'm from as well. And um, certain tracks that came into ballroom, I believe he told me the story about the hot dance, where you know just he played that record. I don't know if it was him or somebody else, but you know brought that record to a ball, and just everybody liked it. Mm. So that's how that kind of went just whatever people liked mm. 
I think it wasn't, you know, the hot dance wasn't made for ballroom. Um, it was just something like other tracks that was picked up and just used by them. Um, also, a huge part of what I'd, what I'd like to get onto as well is the, the sense of movement within the scene and how it directly influences uh, the music itself. Do you know, like, how do you feel about uh, the influence of a particular break, like a hard, like the hard dance, uh, l literally changing the style of moves in the balls? Um, I mean, I think it's amazing the, the, the way it is. It's like with the hard dance, they have this crash sound that happens kind of on every fourth beat. So I think that kind of like, even that, that, I think that even changed Vogue itself, just the, the way that people danced. And, you know, it had that kind of influence and, you know, I think that's just amazing for a track to be made, not for a ballroom or, you know, these guys, masters at work, didn't even know from the beginning that it was being used or as big as it was in ballroom. Um, and for something to be that iconic is, is I don't know. Mm -hmm. And like, even for years now, we've been trying to like, come up with like, what's that next sound that could be sampled <laughs> so much and be a ballroom staple and still haven't figured it out. Okay. You've also um, sampled the hard dance a lot. Uh, should we listen to one of your your sure. strong efforts? Let's do that. Uh, let me see. If I search for hard dance in this, I'm gonna get a lot of yeah. tracks up here. Okay, I have AOL Ha. Huh? How does that sound? Sure, okay. that's one of my first tracks okay. that I did in 2005, I believe. Okay, let's try it. This, this, this is, is another, another, another DJ, DJ Mike Q, Q exclusive. Welcome, 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 welcome. 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 That's, that's fantastic. I just love I love the sense of humour and like the playfulness of that. Thank Tell you. me, um, again, I, I feel like we're always coming back to the CDs, but it's so it feels so crucial to kind of what you do. Um, you've you, you've said a couple of times now that uh, you used to buy the CDs of these tracks like s straight from the DJs and the clubs. Would you, I'm really curious. Would you then go home with these CDs of tracks and then make your own edits further of them? I'd love to know about the process. Yeah, pretty much. Um all the music that I collected, you know, I would I would sample, especially like the ballroom stuff. It just didn't come out of nowhere. So I would get those CDs and sample stuff from there or stuff I found online, which music online wasn't a big thing back then. Um, so, yeah, just like whatever I think I thought sounding good and I would just chop it up and make it into a beat. Um, and then the AOL, ha, that was like really special to me because... AOL is like a big thing with me because that's where my name actually comes from, Mike Q. Um, my name was Mike Q7000 on AOL. And the Q and the 7000 was actually, Infinity used to make a lot of cars, Q and a number. So I just bumped it up to 7000 and added it to Mike. The mm -hmm. Q kind of has like no meaning, no meaning or anything, mm -hmm. but I took the 7000 off and that was my DJ name. Um, I hadn't even been D a DJ yet, but I was DJ Mike Q. Mm. And like later on now, I just rather be Mike Q, okay. although I'm DJing more. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> Tell me about how uh, you fostered um, your early early music and style as a DJ through these online forums, because it almost feels strange to talk about online forums as a file sharing uh, way like did the, how did that those kind of conversations inform you getting involved in the scene and making music um well it was a lot of a lot of like I said posting the music on the forum but then I will also hang out like from the time that I went to the globe in the clubhouse I was there every week um became friends with the DJs and so I'm in the DJ booth and stuff like that and you know it was kind of a thing just to put new edits and stuff out like that's what people they went up for so before I even started DJing I remember taking these edits to the clubs and stuff and the DJs would play them there and just to see the reaction of people um, from something that I sat in my house and made was amazing and DJing you know that just came, that came on later on um, that was actually something I never even wanted to do or producing it just kind of like happened when um, it comes to you playing at the Globe this early shows, obviously you've you've moved on to Serato and things, but when you had these, did you mix them live or were they kind of like pre-mixed sets? Like what was the deal? 
Uh, so back to the way beginning when I first got my first gig, um, I was afraid to DJ. So I would make a CDs with 80 minutes. So I would make on the computer and just paste track for track for 80 minutes and do that through the course of a night. So I had up to seven or eight CDs and start one when it was finished, put in another one. Um, <laughs> so fake it until you make it. Um, and that's what I did until I got more comfortable with DJing. Um, and then I would start to mix track for track live. Okay, okay. So what gave you that, um, I, well, the, not just the idea, but the confidence to go out there? Was it making your own edits? Was it having that edge of like your own original work? Um, I'm not even sure. Um, it did you just it get called like, out? Yeah, <laughs> like it just, it just all happened. Um, the, but a lot of the confidence that I had with actually going to mix track for track came just from the DJs that I was playing with, watching them and stuff, and just learning about stuff like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Now, tell me about your role as a DJ, because it's not simply the case that you turn up to a party and play records for people to dance. Like, the ballroom DJ has a very particular role. Could you describe, if you'd never been to a ball, when you walk in, like, wh where are you? What are you doing? What is the, the social structure of a ball? So, a ball, which is, it's like our, our gay Olympics. Um, and... Uh, the houses they would come and congregate under this roof. Uh, the ballroom, not not your, the ballroom dancing that you know is is it came from like the venues they would have balls at, so like the Mark Ballroom. That's where that name came from, and it's where a lot of houses would come together and compete under this roof. And it's a place where you just come and be yourself and express your creativity. So, you know, anything that you do you can kind of find a space in, in the ballroom, whether you're dancing or fashion, uh, for me, music. Um, and that's how that is. Uh, with me going to balls or just my role as a DJ, it's just there to play music. Um, and what's different about now where I'm DJing in clubs and like my name's on flyers, face and stuff like that at a ball, you barely got your name on the flyer or you're in the back somewhere and could barely see. Like when I was playing at Vogue Nights at Escalita, I was in a back room, like with just a small window, a small bar window that I could barely see out of. So I'd be just playing by my ear. Um, so it was an important role to the ballroom, but it's not like exaggerated. You're, you're certainly not the focus, but your actual craft of DJing is has a very, very direct relationship with the, with, with the crowd. Um, you dictate movement and the movement dictates you, right? Is that how you describe it? Um, yeah, so what it is, I call it the Vogue Trinity. You have the MC, you have the dancer, and you have the DJ, and I feel that one goes off the other two. So I could be you know, watching somebody Vogue and I'll have a track on this side and just have a hot crash on that side. So as I'm watching them do things or if I know they're about to dip or do some crazy stunt, I'll give them, you know, a certain amount of crashes or just some kind of way, as well as listening to the MC and what they're saying and the Vogue, they're listening to the music and the MC and, you know, the other way around. So it's, 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 a, um, it's the, the Vogue journey, what I call it, and everybody works off everybody and that energy Part of that energy, you were saying how uh, Juan Allure would have like different tracks lined up for different categories. What's like your style for DJing for for different categories? Um, well, I, I do I, as well. Like once I started making tracks, I would make category specific tracks as well. And you know, at the ball, you're the only DJ, so you have to play or know what to play for everything. So you have runway tracks, voguing tracks, old way, realness, and things like that. So you just kind of need to know what to play that will get everybody up, um, you know, at the function. What is your favorite category to play tracks for? Maybe we could play something to give people a sense of what that might sound and feel like. Um, definitely voguing is, is my favorite. And, you know, there's many types of voguing, but then also runway is, I think, an amazing category that, that takes, you know, a lot. Uh, I think I have an idea for what to play. Uh, 
Let's play something a little bit classic. This is Moi Renee Miss Honey. Okay. <laughs> yes. Tell um, me about um tell me about the kind of sounds you hear in a track like that cuz that literally sounds like being at a ball. Um well, that that track is funny cuz it's actually not a ballroom track. Um that I would call more of a, a bitch track. And that's something you would hear either before the ball, at the ball, or maybe like at a gay club somewhere or something like that. Um, if I ever played that track at the ball, it would be for like the category uh, Butch Queen Up and Pumps, which is just like pumping up and down a runway with heels on um, and trying not to fall. <laughs> um, so that's something I will play for that. Um, but yeah, there was like this era of, of of bitch tracks that that came out and you know just had like these amazing feminine male voices and said different things and and, and reads and stuff like that um so I, I came in to to find a lot of that music as i got into ballroom um tell me about how uh, we were just mentioning there that like the the vogue trinity of that uh, that experience of 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 djing at balls and at parties like that how does that inform you making your own tracks? Like, do you think of the dancer and the MC when you're making music? Definitely. Um, you know, if anybody asks me my process for making a track, what I'm doing is picturing somebody voguing or walking runway to it. Or, you know, if I'm home alone behind closed doors, you might catch me practicing to some of them. Um, and then, you know, I will also be able to take these tracks to the club. So I would test them out you know, on, on the crowd and see, you know, what kind of response I got to let me know if it was a good track or not or what it could be used for. Because there's different, like, there's battle tracks in ballroom, which are, I would say, more minimal, but still, like, hype beats that don't have much of a vocal on it, but some something that the commentator is able to talk over the top of. Then you have just your other beats that's like practice beats and stuff you would, you know, buy on the CD or listen to at home and stuff like that. It really feels like what you're saying is that it's really, really hard, almost maybe impossible to make a ballroom track if you have no experience of the balls. Um, That's not all the way true um, because I've heard ballroom tracks come from people that probably haven't been, you know, to a ball or don't know that much about it, may have just heard my music or seen one clip or something like that. So, like, a friend of mine, DJ Slink from Jersey, he's a Jersey club producer, and, you know, he's made ballroom tracks that I'm able to take back and use in ballroom that, you know, are just as hot as what we do. But do you think there is perhaps quite a fine line that you can cross over where you can take like the signifiers of the sound is so specific to a scene and then just take it out of context? Um, definitely um, with that, um, let me see, how can I explain this? Put that for me in a different way, like almost. Uh, I suppose like, like it's 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 quite easy because it's such like a, a signature sound to to take these sounds and put them on tracks like not for balls. So you, so you mean like other people outside of the ballroom to take the tracks? Um and that well that is something that's been happening like a lot lately. Um just with people thinking that ballroom is a trend, uh whether the dance or the music. Um or just cool in, in what way. So you'll have a lot of producers, including friends of mine, that just think that you can sample the ha by Masters at Work and that makes it a ballroom beat, um, which it really doesn't because I've heard tracks that have had it all wrong or just the, the crash in a random different place. Um, but that doesn't, make it, that doesn't make it ballroom. So you kind of really do have to be there and experience it to know what you're doing and where stuff kind of goes. Mm. I'm, I'm curious about how um, the scene maintains its like its structure and integrity because you have the Queen Beat Collective. Uh, how would you describe a Queen Beat and how it functions? Um, well, Queen Beat is, is you know, my record label. It, it started out as just a name to put my music under. And over the years, 
from 2005 to now, I just, you know, added members from ballroom and later on outside of ballroom. And we kind of like almost have a, a house structure, family structure, just like ballroom, um, just in a musical sense. Queen Beat was one of the first, I would say the first group period um, to come out of ballroom to be like a collective putting out music and stuff like that. And, you know, others have followed over the years. So, you know, we take we take from ballroom what we do and that kind of family house structure. And it is it is like a family in a house because there's 19 or 20 of you now from yes, all over the world. It is. Yeah, it's 19. great. Um, what kind of roles does everybody play? Like, how is that structure maintained? Um, so I'm the father, the HBIC. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we have different different people that do different things. So we have producers like... Beak, JR Neutron from Ball, um, Baltimore, um, Byrell the Great, who is from New York. You have Kopi, who's from Japan, and she can, she commentates, she makes beats, she does dance classes, so she holds like a lot of hats in that. Um, Deshaun Wesley, who's also a part of Queen Beat, he's a dancer as well as a commentator, so it's mostly built up of DJs, producers commentators dancers and then we have one guy that does like video mashups of he'll put one of our tracks to like different ball clips and things like that and just sync the video to it um so yeah how did you reach out to japan with her because that's really fascinating how a lot of young people are are discovering ballroom fresh through being able just to watch it on youtube uh, which used to be the really the not done thing to go and film balls and now it's like it's, it's vital to the spread of the message. Um, well, with Japan or, or Kopi Mizrahi, um, she she found out about Ballroom maybe, I don't know the year exactly, I want to say 2005 as well, um, just watching them on YouTube. And then she started to come to the States after a while to compete in the latex ball. And from that, she was able to meet up with the people, join the house and stuff like that. And... She was actually one of the first people to book me in Tokyo for her ball there back in 2011. So I kind of I got linked up with her, you know, just from being at the balls here in the States. You know, she was like a, a fresh breath of air to ballroom. She was different. Um, she was also a, a woman, you know, that that was able to come in and. You know, she's now a legend in the ballroom, so she was able to make something of herself here and then take that scene or take ballroom culture back to Japan and do something with it as well. Yeah. Should we should we listen uh, to her track, actually? Um, this is on... Uh, Queendom. Queendom. I was yes. going to let you introduce it, <laughs> seeing as you can introduce it. This is the compilation album uh, that came out uh, in August, just past. Yes. Yeah, great. Okay, let's listen to her track then so you can get a feel of it because it's just, it's just wonderful. This is called A Manco Backpack. Not the kind of track to have a nice, soft transition moment, so I'm just going to have to do that. But that's, uh, that's fantastic. But tell me about... Um, you're saying that it's it's so interesting that this is such a strong, uh, widespread culture now, but Queen Bee is quite rare in that you're actually producing and releasing original music. It Was that kind of not really the done thing for Ballroom? Um, well, no, not really. Like, just me coming in and following behind what I was seeing from the DJs, Tony Cortez, Von Alor, Angel X, where they would sample different those house tracks that were used in early ballroom. So, uh, Work This Pussy by Sweet Pussy Pauline, the, um, Junior Vasquez edit, and uh, Love Is The Message by MFSB, Witch Doctor by Armin Van Helden, um, things like that. So those are those are just a few tracks that also like the ha are heavily sampled. And that's just that kind of like, those are those are ballroom sounds now. So that when you put those sounds into a track, it it makes you if you are familiar with the music, you just know what you're listening to. Um, so that's what I was doing was just sampling a lot rather than making super original stuff. Where you know as the years have gone by and I'm learning now, you know things have changed. So. Mm. 
how has it changed? Because if you're not, this is something that's fascinating, if you're not using that original bank of the core six, seven records or breaks from those records in order to make the ballroom sound, how are you, how do you make n new ballroom without always going back to those original six or seven breaks? Um, well, still, you'll, you'll always, I feel like, still find a little sample of something in ballroom. Um, and just like as the dance kind of changed from what it was early on, um, like now it's like a lot more. So like voguing is split up. It's, there's so many different ways to vogue. It's the old way. Then there was the new way. Then after new way, you know, you got Vogue Femme, which is... Vogue Femme Dramatics, which is self-explanatory, just, you know, being dramatic and doing stunts like that and slamming hard on your back and whatnot. Then you have Soft and Cunt, Realness with a Twist. Um, so those are all, like, different styles of Vogue, and they're just, like, a little bit more faster, a um, lot more dramatic, a lot more stunts and stuff like that. So the music kind of was able to change with that, and I just took, like, what I was hearing, like, here in Jersey Club in Baltimore and house music and what I had heard from Ballroom and just put those elements together and something that kind of worked for what I was doing. I think, um, could we possibly have the TV on? Because uh, I want to show um, a quick video clip. Can you tell me where this party is? So this is Vogue Nights, um, which is in New York City. Uh, it was a party that was started at Escalita, then moved to another club, and this club is at the Copacabana in Times Square, which was the last venue that we were in. And this was in Thanksgiving night. So that is, so that was your uh, the party that you were DJing at for years in New York, which is Vogue Nights. Yeah, uh, six years I've been playing that party. Mm. Now, what perhaps did Vogue Nights do uh, that other balls or parties like it did not do? Was there something unique to Vogue Nights? Um, well, the thing with, so going back to the Globe and the Clubhouse again, the Globe was Jersey's thing, the Clubhouse was Harlem thing. Um, the Globe, that went on till about 2011. Uh, the Clubhouse stopped in maybe... 06, 07, and then after that, they moved to another location under another name, but the same promoters. It was Club Life down in Chinatown. And that was, you know, like the other two, those were just the weekly things that we had to go to. Balls usually happen on an annual basis, or uh, individuals would throw at houses or throw balls at different times, not on a, a weekly thing. Um, so Vogue Nights kind of came in and that was you know the only weekly thing after the other places were gone that's all we had to do um as far as ballroom on a weekly basis while everything was a little bit more spread apart um and then vogue nights the purpose that it served was just to be another another safe space for people to come practice your vogue you know you don't have to be like on your best shit there as compared to like another ball, which actually you do because, you know, you just do. Um, so that's what that was, just, you know, the weekly thing for people to do on a constant basis and, you know, just to, to come and be around people you like. And How has, um, I mean, specifically for New York, obviously there's there's balls and party like this um, all over the US, but particularly for New York, how have you found the change in the city affecting the scene? Uh, I know that Vogue Nights, moved venue quite a few times uh what sort of um issues have you faced um that's what it, what more of it is it's just like the the venues a lot of the venues in new york um in jersey are just like going away um in ballroom events don't have the best reputation um when they go into a venue um and come out leaving it trashed and whatnot and glitter all over the bathroom and whatnot <laughs> Um, so just losing those over the years, you know, a lot of, a lot of things have calmed down with that. And, you know, just recently Vogue Nights lost its venue, um, as well as the promoter. So that, that party kind of like stopped right now. So basically there's beside like the Kiki balls or other annual balls that happen, there's nothing on a weekly basis happening like that anymore in New York, which is the Mecca of ballroom. How does that affect, like, everyone and everything about it? Um, well, now I'm actually, because it was really not much of a space in between 
the globe, the clubhouse, club life, Vogue nights all happening. But now it's been about a month since Vogue nights happened. And it's like myself as well as other people, you just see the post on Facebook about having like withdrawals. Um, there's nowhere to go in in that form to to see your friends or just certain people. So there's a lot of people I don't I don't see unless I'm at a ball or at Vogue nights in particular. Um, so now it's like everybody's just like a internet personality again, um, and there's nowhere to go. How does um how does that affect the the social purpose of balls? It's not just somewhere to go and listen to music and show. It's it has a social structure for people who who very much need it. How is how is that affecting? Um. Well, um, with some people and like balls, so like a lot of cash prizes would be given out for grand prize. So, you know that that paid. I'm pretty sure a lot of people's rent or you know put food on their table and things like that. Um. So, and in a way, you know that that's kind of like gone for some people. Um. Even myself is you know put a little thing in my pocket with, you know, just not being able to make money from that no more. Um, and, um, you know, there's still balls that happen. Uh, there's still houses that, that congregate and, and get together just as their house or other balls that may happen and come up. That's when, you know, everybody will get together again. Um, but socially, I'm not really sure. I guess everybody's just like going to, you know, other parties or, um, where they we used to hang out in the village in New York City, which has changed drastically since back in the day. Like that's not even a place you would go anymore to like hang out with your friends. So I don't know. I, I stay in the house if I'm not out DJing. So socially, I'm doing nothing. Um, you mentioned the Kikis as well. Um, the the Queen Beat crew have done the official soundtrack to the Kiki film. Could you tell us about that film project? Um, that film project, well, that film is, um, very different from, let's, let's say Paris is Burning, which is, you know, the other film with Kiki that kind of digs in deeper to, uh, a little bit more other issues that we deal with in ballroom. So political issues, uh, violence, death, health issues, and, um, it's more character based. So, you know, it follows a certain group of characters and kind of their life and how they they come into the Kiki scene, which is the Kiki scene is like a subculture within the culture of ballroom, um, mostly participated by the youth. So let's say 14 to 24 years old. Um, and just another, you know, another thing, another safe space for this younger generation to to go to and, and do you know, the ballroom thing. And then, you know, eventually they come into the regular scene as well. Um, so, you know, it's all connected in a way. Um, but the Kiki scene or the Kiki film rather is just different in that way from Paris is Burning. Um, it's still entertaining, but just it's like an update on what's happening now in ballroom. Do you, um, it's really interesting when you think about how the, this new film um, about the Kiki scene is like you say, it's not like Paris is burning. And I, uh, I feel that there's a certain, um, when when Madonna like brought out Vogue and when a lot of people's lives were, were put on show or exposed around Paris is burning, uh, there was like a crest of cultural capital around the ballroom scene in Vogue and a lot of people did not benefit from it. Um, do you feel that that um, ballroom has had to survive in certain ways after that happened, and this Kiki film is an example of it. I'm curious about your thoughts. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, with ballroom, it's, it's always a thing of survival, and for it to be a culture that has come this long way, you know, stands for something. Um, and kind of got lost in what we were saying. How there was, um, you know, a wider kind of pop culture moment around Vogue, and it, you know, a lot of people in the scene did not benefit from it. Right. Um. So with Kiki film, um, I don't know the the whole story on Paris is Burning, but with Kiki, a member from Ballroom Twiggy, Pucci Garcon approached Sarah Giordano, the director of Kiki, about doing the project. So. Uh, ballroom participants are a lot more involved in the production of this film and putting it out. And, you know, from that, they've been able to go places around the world just to travel from that film and, you know, do different things. Even myself being at Sundance Festival last year and 
just going to different places, doing Q and A's and whatnot, and it's been it's been great. So um, it's different in that way, and you know, it's something that we hope will give back to the community and just you know spread what it is and make awareness about it. And and obviously, films like this, when it comes out quite soon, people will be able to see it for themselves. But um, what do you think um, ballroom like? could continue to do or do or do different or adapt to in order to make sure that everybody is is elevated in it um just i feel like just praising your own your own people um and then just watching what outside people do kind of like with ballroom is not really like a cap on what people do so you have dancers who are going out and doing like big dance classes and that's like almost to me recruiting like a whole army of new people into ballroom that are just coming in through the dance or the trend um but not through like the experience um then you have me who's spreading ballroom through music um and just you know other ways so there's there's no one person that says what goes how um so it's, i think it's important just for everybody to to realize what you're doing with it and whose hands you put it into and, you know, who gets noticed for it and, you know, things like that because it's the people that created the scene and are living it every day that should be, you know, making something from it or, you know, just doing something with it. Those are the faces I feel you should see. Cool. Well, we've been very glad to see your face today. So um, before I go to questions, I want to say thank you very much to Mike Q for talking today. Thank, thank you. you. Does anyone have a question for Mike at all? Okay, um, I'm Jan. Hi, thank Hello. you for being here. Um, you touched upon uh, briefly upon music producers taking sounds from ballroom and trying to come up with their own ballroom sound uh, and getting it right or getting it wrong. I'm curious about how that is perceived in the actual scene. I'm thinking of the Apple spot that Apple put out to advertise their iPhone 7 last year, which featured a ballroom-inspired track that I guess like a lot of people thought might be your production, but which actually was like a French thing, like from Paris. Right. Not related to ballroom at all. Like, what did you think of that? How was that discussed in the scene? Is there like a good way to appropriate your sound or a bad way? Um. Well, in the scene, I don't think a lot of people like really knew it well the people that did see it um people started tagging me like oh congratulations on this track that you made and stuff like that i'm like no i didn't do this and you know they like the track um appropriation of the music isn't a big talked about thing in the scene itself it's just something that i like to blurb about a lot um because it's important or other djs but like you won't really find other people in ballroom discussing that topic of music and appropriation. Um, and with that, there is a, a feel a right way to go about it, which is just being informed about what you're doing. So to, to, to go to a ball and get knowledge and know who, what, where, when, why, all those things. And then you come in, you know, make an edit or whatever. But then, you know, if it's not your thing, I wouldn't say stay there or continue to keep on doing it. You know, go back to what you do. I like when producers can make a track for ballroom and I can take it back and play it for a ball and, you know, stuff like that. So there's ways to do about it. But this guy in particular, I had seen um, an interview he did where he was just kind of being like an asshole and kind of just like brushing it off like it's just, you know, dance music. So why can't, you know, I make edits or whatever? Um, and then with Apple, I don't think they knew what they were going for. I don't think they were going for like a ballroom track. They just might have been looking at that certain producer and like that certain track of his. Did you want to ask one as well? I know you're just right at the front, but we'll need it for everyone. It's okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to know uh, your involvement in Ghetto Gothic and how you met, you met with Venus and how it started, how it changed New York? Um, well, Ghetto Gothic, I didn't come into that until, I, I believe it was started in 09. I didn't come into it until 2011. 
Um, just, you know, once I started playing other parties outside of ballroom. Um, and that was, that's like, still is the coolest thing I think you can attend in New York outside of maybe a Vogue event. And that's just like, you know, this amazing party where, like ballroom, different people can come under one roof, gay, straight, white, black, whatever, and enjoy themselves. And, you know, that's that's kind of been like, I don't know, just a monumental thing to me um, to be a part of. And it's taken me other places. So I played Ghetto Gothics in Russia, Toronto, different places. Um, and, you know, with Ghetto Gothic also, we were also to bring like balls there. So we've had like small category or two and, you know, made into that. So that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Nice. Anyone else? Oh. Hey. Hi, Mary. <laughs> um, just in regards to appropriation and um, just being informed about the balls and the sound, and did you find that um, a lot of DJs from all over the world or just outside of the scene and pop stars even coming down to Vogue nights on a regular basis to just to know what's going on and to, to experience a culture? Um, well, the thing with that, I hadn't even seen a lot of people actually come to balls uh besides like let's say fk twigs um she might have came to vogue nights on like three occasions and then you know did whatever she did with it um don't have a super comment on that um <laughs> um i don't know i like her i like her and um she did what she did but it's like okay where is it now i don't see anything that she's doing today with ballroom or or trying to inform people of what ballroom is. So, you know, people, they come in and they try to take bits and pieces of what they want and do whatever with it. And, you know, that's it to them. And I just remember you saying something on Facebook about um, the one time Madonna called and you weren't in town and she wanted to come to one of the parties. Did she ever come down? <laughs> um, no, and that was, that's funny. That's actually uh, Diplo, who, you know, became a friend of mine. Um, you know, is friends with her, and he's the one that texts me and wanted to bring her to, yeah, he wanted to bring her to a Vogue night, but Vogue nights happens on, like, Monday or Tuesday, and this was on a Friday, so, you know, but that probably wouldn't have happened anyway. <laughs> Actually, speaking of um, of pop stars, uh, I know that Missy Elliott slid into your DMs a few years ago, uh, and you, how was that experience with her? Was that a bit more... Um, Conducive. Well, with her, I had met her in New Jersey. Actually, I was DJing. This is I was DJing at this um, this older club, older crowd club, and they had a Vogue night there. It was a Wednesday, so her, Queen Latifah, and Salt and Pepper, they all came. It was like nobody there, like maybe fifteen of us, and they're here waiting for a ball to happen. So, I met her there the first time, and I gave her some music. Um, and then it was like years later, once I got on Twitter and stuff, um, she hit me up and she was like, I need your help on something. Um, send me some music. So I sent her some stuff and to come to find out, she actually just wanted music to, she was doing one of her artists, Sharia J, looking for a producer for her. Um, and she actually ended up using uh, DJ J Hood, who does Jersey Club. So I guess she was wanting more of the Jersey Club sound. And just like as a gift, for doing, you know, sending her music. She kind of recorded over one of my tracks and did like a little one minute commentation and, you know. That's, one, that's wonderful. That yeah. must have been really nerve wracking being in like a empty room with all of them going, oh, where's the ball? Yeah, like <laughs> um, very amazing. Um, or, or other times like Queen Latifah, I've probably met her more than anybody first on my street where I lived at because she's from East Orange as well. And she brought Missy Elliott there, and then she came to like Vogue nights, and she's like in the DJ booth, just like touching my Serato and stuff, and <laughs> rubbing on my shirt. And she didn't really want to be announced that she was there, but you know, she hopped on the mic from the back a couple of times, but nobody knew it was her. Um, Janelle Monae's been there, Yo Yo, um, the rapper, but you never seen any of them do anything. Ballroom was just you know coming out to enjoy themselves. I suppose that's kind of the way to do it, right? Just turn up, but don't show off. Let everybody else yeah. do that. Yeah. Okay, great. Anyone else got any questions? You can ha you're allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> My last one, sorry. 
um, I'm curious about your rela relationship with Roman Anthony. I was very surprised that on your compilation there was this track by you and Roman Anthony, one of the greats of you know New Jersey House, but he has passed a couple of years ago. So did you actually work on that track together or how um, did that come about? Well, with him, we actually never met. Um, it was just... When he, when we when we first started talking, I found out that he would. I used to stream Vogue Nights live on Mondays, and somehow he found out about that, and he would chime into the stream. So then he sent me a track, that track, um, like the early edits of it, and he said he just made it just being inspired from what he was watching, and he passed it on to me to to finish it, which he never you know got to hear because he passed unfortunately. Well, it's um, it's great. It got a proper release, so everyone can hear it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much again, Mike. You really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.